What's up, y'all? Welcome back to another Lawns Across America podcast, first one of summer 2023. In this one, I'm going to be looking at phosphorus levels in the soil and seeing what I can get from that by comparing different geographies. Pretty interesting little study using soil test data. Secondly, we're going to talk about gray leaf spot strategies, mostly in St. Augustine grass because that's where it's attacking heaviest right now. But of course, I think you can all learn just from listening to the approach. And then finally, I interview Sean Langton of Cujo Yardware, who risked his entire life savings to start this company, creating a brand new segment in the shoe world, the segment of Yard Shoe. And now the company's expanding and growing, and it's really cool to hear his entire story. So with that, let's get right into this episode. All right, y'all, welcome back to another segment. Today, we're going to talk about phosphorus. Now, before you leave me because you don't care about phosphorus, let me explain what we're going to do, and then we're going to actually dig into some data that I have that'll be super interesting, and I think it'll open up some conversation for the future that some of you guys will like. Um, And it's based on all the soil test data I have. I have thousands of soil tests now, and so I can see some pretty cool things. So what brought this this thought up for me was, you guys know I did a, a... a video on malorganite a couple weeks ago where I had to put down the half rate. So just to, for a refresher, malorganite, it's a 32 pound bag and it covers 2,500 square feet. Um, However, in Florida, there's a special rate right underneath that that says Florida covers 5,200 square feet. And the reason they do that is they want a half rate. And so what happened was that, or I'll tell you why they do it in a minute, but I tried that half rate on my neighbor's lawn. So instead of putting 32 pounds across 2,500, I put 32 pounds across 5,200, the Florida law, and I did not see very much visual change in the lawn. Now, there's been a huge visual change now because I applore, applied um, flagship to it, 24x6 flagship, a few days before the FERT ban, so it's dark green now. But the Malorganite, after three weeks, did not really show too much of a difference at that half rate. And that's just because they're just wasn't enough nitrogen there. It's only 6% nitrogen. And when you cut it in half, you're not even getting a half a pound of nitrogen. It's like 0.36, I think I came up with uh, when I did the math. It's just not very much nitrogen. And it wasn't enough to really show a visual result. But so why does Florida have that half rate? Why do they have that restriction that the bag can only cover 5,200? Well, it doesn't have anything to do with nitrogen, really. It's mostly to do with phosphorus. I think nitrogen is a piece of it. But it's really phosphorus. Those two elements, you know, we have that FERT ban here in the summer. You can't apply nitrogen or phosphorus. I've done podcasts on that before. I'll link to. I had a water quality specialist on named Adam Kirchis. We Kirchin, we talked about the water quality. We talked about red tide. We talked about runoff. And everything that, that the state of Florida is doing there is they're trying to mitigate runoff of nitrogen and phosphorus into the waterways because that can exacerbate red tide. It can make red tide worse. It doesn't cause red tide. Red tide is a thing that's here forever. It's been here forever. The Native Americans have written about it. You can see it um, in, in their, their writings. However, extra nitrogen and phosphorus, especially in the water, can make it worse. So that's why we have the bands in the summer, because we have these giant rainstorms, super hardcore rainstorms that come in, and they will just dish, they'll just wash everything off. Doesn't matter what it is. It'll wash it right out. And if you've applied heavy, heavy amounts of malorganite, for example, that has to go down at a, at a higher rate. There's more of it on the ground. There's more pounds on the ground. There's more of it that can be washed away. So uh, what Florida does is they say, hey, you could only apply this at this half rate and you can only do it twice a year. And obviously you can't do it inside the FERT bands because it has nitrogen and phosphorus. So with that, again, I didn't necessarily get the greatest results, but what it, what it got me thinking of is Let's just see if, if and we're going to talk about phosphorus, let's just look at Florida in general and let's just see how much phosphorus is around different parts of Florida. Since I have all this soil test data, why don't I use it for something? Why don't I take a look? Do we even need fl- phosphorus in Florida? Do we even need to apply it? So uh, I had my my soil testing partner, my soil, send over uh, a bunch of uh, results for Florida and I broke that down essentially by um, zip code and, uh, and I can tell you what the phosphorus levels are according to our samples that we've gotten from our customers. I can tell you what the phosphorus levels are in different parts of Florida. And I thought this was pretty interesting. So I'll, if you're watching on YouTube, I'll put a map up of Florida to kind of show you uh, so you can kind of see each area and what the phosphorus is. So we're going to start with the lowest. Who in Florida has the lowest phosphorus on average and what is it? So just so you guys know, the target for phosphorus is 5 to 11 parts per million. That's according to our testing uh, and our testing methodology. 
5 to 11 parts per million. Now, remember, our tests are looking at what is readily available in the soil. There's no extra math to do. There's no calculations to think what might be released or not. This is what's available currently. So it's real-time data, and you want to be between 5 and 11 parts per million to be what is considered in normal range. Now, if you're at the low end, if you got your test back and, you're, and, you're, and your phosphorus is 5.1, you're in normal range, but you're still going to need to add some down the road because you're going to go lower as the turf grows, or you possibly could, right? Just as if you're uh, over uh, 11, you're not going to add anymore. So I just want to kind of say that just because you're within the target, it doesn't mean you don't use it at all. It's the same thing. Like if you go to the doctor and you get blood work done and he goes, oh, your your levels in of iron in your system are great. Oh, well, I'm not going to eat any more, anything with iron in it then anymore. Well, no, you're just going to keep eating the iron that you've been eating. Or in the case of soil, some of this is naturally occurring. So if that didn't confuse you too much, let's just get into the data because I think it's really cool. So the lowest phosphorus in Florida is up in the Jacksonville, St. Augustine area. And the average phosphorus in Jacksonville is 11.57. So remember that the av the target is between 5 and 11 parts per million. And in Jacksonville, the average, and I had 523 samples I looked at there, the average is 11.57. So they're on the highest end of, of the acceptable range in Jacksonville and St. Augustine in the soil. And again, that's 523 different samples from around that area. We did have some that were low. There were 156 below. There were 202 that were within and 165 that were above normal or, or uh, target range. But the average is 11.57. So the very lowest in Florida, that's the lowest. The lowest in Florida is already at the top end of what is considered ideal. So that was pretty interesting. 11.57 is the average phosphorus in St. Augustine and Jacksonville area. So if you live in one of those areas, you probably do not need to apply phosphorus. Now, next, let's look at the next one. And the next one is going to be the east coast of Florida. So over around Boca, over there, that area over there, the east coast. And their average is 15, that's Boca Raton, by the way, Jupiter, that area, 15.27 parts per million. So on average, they're over ideal just sitting there just the native soils the native florida soils are already high in phosphorus in the boca boca raton jupiter area 15.27 so i had 219 samples there 47 came in below 67 within and 105 above but an average of 15.27 so if you live on the east coast of florida probably not going to need any phosphorus next we're going to go to south florida which is really just below so i consider south florida like miami dade Miami area down there. And uh, that area, it's it's really grouped into 332, 331, and 330 for the zip code. So that part of South Florida there, their average is very close to the same as Boca Jupiter. They're at 15.56. So the East Coast, Boca and Jupiter in that area was 15.27. South Florida at 207 samples is 15.56. So they're essentially the same, which makes sense. Those are two geographically very close places. So still high phosphorus though, uh, above what is ideal right out of the gates. Okay, let's look at the next one. The next one in line is what I call the is what is called the Nature Coast. So this is north of Pinellas County, but not into the Panhandle. It's it's all that area right there um, in the nook on the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, again, if you're watching on YouTube, I've got that circled. But this is the west coast of Florida, but it's the northern. So it's not Pensacola. It's not the Panhandle. It's not up there. It's just south of that. So that is called the Nature Coast, and the Nature Coast has an average of 17.48. I had 198 samples there, 22 below, 16 within, 114 above, but average 17.48. So if you live on the Nature Coast, no need for phosphorus. Now we have quite a few here to go, so let's just keep going. Next, Central Florida. So this is going to be you know around Orlando, up into the villages, all of that area, Ocala even. So Central Florida, 19.56 is the average. Again, our target, 5 to 11. Central Florida out of the box without applying anything, 19.56 parts per million of phosphorus. That's based on 676 samples, so quite a few more there. We did have 79 below, 200 within, 397 above average, 19.56. And 58% of the samples were above, so above uh, normal. So that's pretty interesting there. Uh, next one, the next one in line. Let's see, where are we going now? Now... Um, I'm going to skip this one here because I want to talk about it in the end because there are phosphorus mines in that area. So we'll skip that one. I'll come back to it at the end. Let's go next to, 
Uh, I did St. Petersburg by itself. And I did that because St. Pete is a peninsula. It sits between Tampa Bay and the Gulf on the west coast of Florida. Um, and I just didn't, and I didn't know if it was different because it's its own peninsula. You know, Florida is a peninsula, and then St. Petersburg is a rather large peninsula within that peninsula. And uh, you guys have been across the famed Skyway Bridge, possibly. So St. Pete all by itself. We had 94 samples there. 22.53 average, average phosphorus parts per million. We have five samples below, 31 within, and 58 above. 61% were above. So 22.53 is the average. Now think about this. Our lowest, Jacksonville, St. Augustine, is 11.57. Now we're at St. Petersburg, 22.53. So it's got double. St. Pete has double the natural phosphorus in the soil when compared to Jacksonville, which is also pretty high anyway. All right, who is next? Who is next? That actually was the highest. Okay, so that's the last one I had was St. Pete. That's the highest at 22.53, but very close and not far away. I wanted to call out Manatee County and Hardy County. These are, these are some people call this Southwest Florida. It's still the Tampa Bay area. Manatee County is. Hardy County is a little more inland, but we're still not far from that Lakeland area, south of Lakeland, actually, south of Tampa, we're kind of in there. We're not down into Naples or that. Which, wait, did I do Naples? I don't know if I did. I don't think I did Naples. I'll have to go back and get you guys. So sorry, I didn't mean to leave you out on purpose. <laughs> but anyway, I have Manatee and I have Hardy County. The reason I asked for those is there's these phosphorus mines there, um, a company called Mosaic. And and I don't, if somebody from Mosaic would is listening to this and would like to come on, I would love to learn from you. Um, you guys have so much going on out there with those mines. I know they find a lot of shark's teeth when they're digging and stuff. I'd like to talk about that, but really just what are you guys doing out there? And then what does it mean when somebody doesn't own the mineral rights to their property? Because I think Mosaic has a lot of mineral rights. What does that do? What does that mean? Just something interesting to talk about. And you don't have to be from Mosaic. You can just be a land surveyor that knows about those things. But either way, they're, they're mining phosphorus in these counties. So I thought, well, the phosphorus must be super high there. So Manatee and, and Hardy County, I had 200 samples. It's 20.1 average. So it's actually lower than St. Petersburg, which is our highest at 22.53. Um, but Manatee and Hardy counties are 20.1. Now, I, I realize the sample sizes are different here, y'all. I'm not a statistician. I'm not an economist. So I know there's a lot of ways to poke holes in this data. It's just for fun, okay? St. Petersburg being a singular sample, some of the other ones that are more widespread, if I was to break those down into smaller geographies, I might have super high sections or pockets there like St. Petersburg does. But either way, it was just interesting to see that 22.53 St. Petersburg is the highest. Manatee, Hardy County, second highest. That's where there are phosphorus mines. They're at 20.1 on the average, and 55% uh, of the samples are over. So that was some interesting data I figured I would go through, but basically it seems like almost all of Florida, you really don't need to add phosphorus to your lawn. Now, there would be an interesting discussion to be had about adding phosphorus if you are doing some low, some seeding or, uh, or some sodding. Is that uh, phosphorus that you add, is it readily available? Whereas the stuff that's in the soil when something hasn't rooted yet, um, it's got to go a little deeper to get to it. So having some phosphorus applied there is helpful. That's another discussion to have. And uh, I think we'll have that one on a future podcast. But it is true. If you live in Florida, you probably don't need phosphorus. Now, you should still get a soil test on your own because in this, you know, for example, in South Florida, 18% of the samples were below, so 38 to 200, but 18% is, is significant. And on the East Coast, 47 samples of the 219 were below, so 21.46 were low in FOSS. So just because the averages are high, right, it doesn't mean that you if you have a soil test that shows you're low in phosphorus, you shouldn't apply it. You should if your soil test shows that it is, because again, there are pockets or areas where it can be. Central Florida, that average of 19.56, but 11% of samples were still below. St. Pete, only 5% below. So St. Pete, no, you definitely do not need phosphorus in St. Pete. Nature Coast, 11% of samples were below. Jacksonville, St. Augustine, 30% of samples were below. And, and again, Jacksonville, St. Augustine, that is actually the lowest phosphorus naturally occurring in the soil that we have of all of the data, with 30% of their samples being below normal and 38% being within acceptable. So just some pretty cool data. If you guys like this kind of stuff, I thought what I would do is get the guys from my soil on, but we'll do some different data, maybe on, on phosphorus, maybe we'll do some pH stuff because we have pH. Look at areas of the country where pH is high, low, or in within target range, and, and maybe we'll be able to find out why. So if that's something that interests you, we can start gathering that data, and I'll have it with some people that are much smarter than me, the my soil guys. We'll talk to them and what they can glean from that and what it, what it means and what ramifications there are 
uh, based on those results. But I thought that was kind of interesting, something to go into just real quick for you guys. Right, y'all i'm going to stick to some warm season topics today just because it's top of mind i'm seeing a lot of you guys with st augustine grass coming now that we're into the summer and this is across texas and florida and everywhere in between that has st augustine grass you're starting to see a lot of gray leaf spot this is one of those that you, i would tell you if you have a st augustine grass lawn just get used to living with it 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 does provide or give this little brownish cast across the lawn when it's kind of grown but once you cut, you got to think about it, gray leaf spots mostly just on the leaf surface. So when you cut, you're literally cutting all the disease off. And so, I don't know, I've just never had it cause long-term damage. Yeah, I mean, I don't like the splotches on the leaves. Sometimes when it gets really bad, it'll cause like this cupping and curling at the ends of the grass blades. And then a lot of times you also have rhizoctonia that's living right along with it because it likes the same conditions. Um, which rhizoctonia can do a little bit more damage. But really, I think gray leaf spots, the main one a lot of you guys are seeing, and for me, for the most part, I just live with it. Right now, it's in my lawn. Now, one of the nice things about having a dog now, I walk walk him a lot, is that I'm spending more time looking at my neighbor's lawns. I've always looked at them, been observant, like when I ride my bike through the neighborhood or whatever, but now it's literally every day and I'm walking past them. So I'm observing and seeing these lawns day after day after day after day, and I'm able to make comparisons to what I'm seeing in my lawn. The other thing I know is I know which lawns in the neighborhood have been treated by companies, uh, which are DIY or which do nothing. And there's quite a few that just do nothing as far as fur and squirt goes. And so I'm able to see. And by the way, all of them have gray leaf spot right now. Now, some worse than others, but a lot of that I think is more of a case of sun and shade exposure as well as water um, exposure in these lawns rather than furt or no furt. The, the thing you worry about or that I see happen too much, I've said this before, is that people that have their lawn fertilized they're told well you caused the fungus because you put down too much nitrogen because somebody read something on a university website and they're misquoting it uh truthfully nitrogen doesn't cause disease disease being in the lawn and uh disease spores in the lawn a host the lawn the lawn is the host and then the right conditions those three things the disease triangle again you have the spores in the lawn, number one. Number two, you have the host, which is the lawn. And number three, you have the right conditions, which typically is going to be higher humidity uh, at night, warmer temperatures at night. That's going to bring on disease. That's what causes disease, not nitrogen. Now, can nitrogen make it worse? Yes. If you have some of these diseases in your lawn and you keep hammering the lawn with a pound of nitrogen every month, then what it does is it creates more flesh for the disease to, to chew on. But in the case of gray leaf spot, again, you're just cutting it off anyway. Right, so whatever gets infected gets cut off, and I'm mowing every three days right now. So it's like boom, 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 you know what I'm saying? So I haven't treated for it. I haven't been concerned about it. But what happens is when you tell people that nitrogen causes the disease, they stop using all nitrogen, and then their lawns get peaked and weak. And I can show you the lawns in my neighborhood that have not been treated. They look terrible. Some of them have some gray leaf spots. Some of them don't, but they just look terrible because they're not treated. They're not, they're not fed. They're starved. There's no nitrogen there. Nitrogen drives the bus. All this low nitrogen stuff, that might work on Kentucky bluegrass that's really only awake up north for like three months, but it just doesn't work on St. Augustine grass in South Florida that is constantly battling weeds and disease pressure and insect pressure and, and extreme temperatures. I mean, it's, you know, it, it needs to be fed. It needs to be fueled. I, I don't know how else to say it. And of course, then your lawn looks better. So that's why you need to feed it, but you just don't want to hammer it with a pound of nitrogen. That's why we make stress blend, right? High potassium to help with the stress. A little bit of nitrogen, 7%. Got a little ammonium sulfate in there, just a whiff to give you a blue-green pop and uh, some urea. And so it's enough to feed the lawn, to give it what it needs, to keep it green, but not to flush the growth. That's kind of the idea. Okay, so long and the short of it is, though, I live with the gray leaf spot. If it does get really bad, and I think it's starting to cause visual harm to my lawn, which can happen. But again, sometimes that's rhizoctonia. Then I will go ahead and spray. Now, the thing you want, if you have um, gray leaf spot, 100% is Cleary's 3336F. That is the fungicide, Cleary's 3336F. 
it works really well as a preventative or a curative on gray leaf spot. I have seen great results using that. It is a, is it New Farm? Let's see. I was going to just read the label a little bit for you guys here. Let's see. Yeah, it's a New Farm product. Um, turf and ornamental systemic fungicide, active ingredient, theophanate, thiophanate, methyl, thiophanate, tiophanate, teophanate, theophanate, theophanate, theophanate. That's what it looks like. I said it all the different ways. 41% concentration. So very interesting product from New Farm. So it works super well. Let's, uh, let's look at what the PPE is on this. Uh, handlers, mixing and loading. No, we're not mixing and loading necessarily um, as a dip. We're not doing that. All other mixers and loaders and applicators. All right, applicators must wear long sleeve shirt and long pants, shoes plus socks, waterproof gloves, chemical resistant apron for mixers, loaders, and other handlers. No, but again, applicators, that's that's the standard right there. Long sleeve shirt and long pants, shoes plus socks, waterproof gloves. We used to throw in eye protection too because you I mean, a lot of times things can splash into your eyes, but I don't, uh, I don't know. I don't see that much anymore, but there's the PPE on the Cleary. So it's the same as pretty much everything else um, that's out there. Nothing too crazy here. Now you are going to want to tank mix this with another fungicide of another, uh, another group. By the way, the Cleary's is group one. It's a group one fungicide. And when it comes to, to the groups, what that means is it's the mode of action. How does the chemical approach the fungus in this case? What does it do? Um, to to mitigate the fungus. And you want to use something from with fungicides especially, two different modes of action or two different groups. So you're attacking the fungus in two different ways. And what this does is it helps it to avoid resistance or uh, helps avoid resistance. So the Clearies is a group one. And then you could use azoxystrobin as your other. Um, I don't know off the top of my head what uh, group that one is, but it's another group. Azoxystrobin works great. And um, it will have some efficacy on the gray leaf spot. Most of the Heavy lifting will be done by the clearings, but then with that with that other mode of action, you're still helping. And then also the azoxy is good on that rhizoctonia. That might also be in there. Uh, I don't know if clearies is listed for um, pat, brown patch. Let's see. Take all patch, Bermuda grass decline, uh, cool season brown patch, large brown patch, rhizoctonia solani. So yes. So... Um, Clearies is also listed for brown patch. Now, how well it does, or rhizoctonia, how well it does, I don't know, but both are. So, so what I'm saying is that's a really good knockout one-two punch there if gray leaf spot is your lead problem. Now, if it's not, um, and it's more rhizoctonia, then, you know, maybe you want to go with propiconazole and also with the azoxystrobin as your mix. It might be a little cheaper for you because you can get... Um, you can get both azoxystrobin and the propiconazole easily at a Home Depot, whereas the Cleary's 3336F is only a professionally formulated product. you got to buy it from a Do My Own or Amazon or something like that. Nothing wrong with that, but that's just some people are scared of those those uh, those those products, those uh, concentrated, professional concentrated products. There's a little more more uh, weighing you need to do, or in this case, measuring, but the, the, the bottle that the Cleary's comes in is a tip and pour, so you just tip it out. And it's got the measuring cup kind of built into the top for you. And it's a pretty low use rate. So you're going to be fine. Something I thought was interesting with the Clearies, I did a video, which I'll link below if you're listening. I did a video on June 14th, 2021. So a couple years ago, almost exactly two years ago, where I showed this exact treatment for my St. Augustine grass, which was the Clearies and the Azoxystrobin. The Clearies was, uh, it's a two ounce per thousand rate. It's a 32 ounce bottle. So 16,000 square feet of coverage. And it was $52 back two years ago. $52 for the Clearies. That was the cheapest price I can find. Right now, the cost for that same product on Dumeon is $64.80. So it's gone up $12.80. And the, if my math is right, so like $12. And on Amazon, it's like $89. But that's gone up $12 in two years. That's just another sign of inflation. That's not a shot on Dumeon. Just one of those things I'm noticing all across the industry is that this inflation is everywhere. So for those of you that are concerned about last kind of wrap up here that are concerned about it. I, again, want to stress, I let the gray leaf spot go. I can see it in my lawn. Yeah, I don't like it, but it's fine. My lawn is still green and everybody else it's still healthier. It's still growing fine. It's not slowed down. We're in our fert band now and it looks awesome. It's vigorous. I'm mowing every three days and cutting off any damaged stuff anyway. And no, I'm not catching my clippings because let's be honest with you. I should do a video on this. Nobody's catching their clippings, man. I would be, I, I would have to run to the city dump 
Uh, I'd have to fill the back of my trailer with the clippings, uh, you know, to, it's just so much clippings. You guys, if you haven't had a St. Augustine lawn at this time of year, you don't understand the amount of clipping management that you have. And so it's not practical to bag. So I'm not doing that, even though you should. It's okay to break rules. I said this in my last video. None of this is the King James Bible, right? There's just, there are best practices that we follow. We call them rules, the one-third rule, always bag when there's disease. But, it, but I mean, nobody's turning you in, right? You're not, you're not getting canceled for it. So just don't bag. You're fine, okay? Just recycle the clippings. Let the disease get back in the lawn. It's fine. Think of it like you're working the lawn out. You're like, you know what? Bro, lawn, you need to deal with this disease a little bit harder. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put those, I'm gonna rub those splotches all back in your face. Make you just deal with it some more because I want you to get strong. Because my lawn is strong and it can get the friction on. You know what I'm saying? And it's long. So it's got plenty of vigor to get through all this. So there you go. I wouldn't worry about the gray leaf spot, but if you are, there's some advice for you. All right, y'all, wanted to end off this podcast with an interesting interview I did with Sean Langton. He is the founder of Cujo Yardware. As you guys know, I worked with him this year. And so um, I thought, you know, it might be interesting to learn a little bit more about Sean and his journey as an entrepreneur. And I think you'll find that very interesting. They're growing in our community. You'll see them now at the GIE Expo or whatever they call it now and uh, all around the community and stuff. So it's just really cool when you see a brand that grows within our community and they're starting to make great things and new things and better things. For us, it's just always interesting to get to know a little bit more about the founder. So here's my interview with Sean LinkedIn. All right, Sean, great to have you. Thank you so much for taking time today. I guess we'll just jump right into it. And uh, I haven't had you on the podcast before, so some folks in my audience may be new to you and your brand, Cujo Yardware. Um, tell us a little bit about Cujo Yardware, but then also your origin story. Like, when did you start this? Why? How? Tell us where you, what your origin story is. Yeah, definitely. And thanks for having me on here, Alan. Um yeah, so Cujo Yardware, we're uh, we're a footwear and, and apparel brand uh, specifically designed for yard work, lawn care, landscaping. Um, you know, our core products are footwear, so we have some yard shoes, slip-on shoes, safety toe boots, some work pants. So, so a nice line of stuff, all designed for being outside, outdoor working. So that's you know, it, real quickly, that's that's what we do, that's what we're about. But yeah, asking about the origin story. Um, mm -hmm. You know, this is this is uh, my baby. This is my my brand. And, you know, we started a few years ago, really out of just personal experience and something I felt a need. So um, at the time, um, you know, kind of going back further, I worked construction when I was a kid. My dad owned a small construction company. I was always working outside. I hated heavy work boots, just hated it. So I was the kid, you know, when I was a teenager, I was wearing my Nikes on the job site. My dad was always like, put on your boots, wear your boots. And I just hated heavy boots. So that was kind of, you know, my background, you know, fast forward, I'm, I'm a homeowner and I just, I love working at my yard, you know, similar to you and, and a lot of people listening, probably, I just love uh, working on my yard, my grass, all that stuff. And same thing, I'd be wearing tennis shoes because I like the lighter, the comfort, but doing it in Michigan is dewy grass. My feet were getting soaked in the morning. So I found myself waiting until 11 noon for, for that dew to burn off. And then, you know, I was slipping on this hill in my backyard because my tread was worn on my old Nikes. And, you know, I was like, there's got to be something better. So just personally, I was literally Googling lawn mowing shoe, yard work shoe, and couldn't find anything. And uh, eventually, after doing that for about two years, I said, you know what? I'm just going to create this thing. I'm just going to create like the ultimate lawn care yard work shoe. And, and that's kind of where the, the idea sparked. And so you didn't, so you haven't been in clothing or apparel before that you just <laughs> literally like, I'm going to solve a problem that I have. And you just went about doing it. How do you start that Where Who do you call? Like, how do you even know where to go? Uh, right. <laughs> um, fortunately I, I, I was never in clothing or apparel, but I was in consumer products. So I've been in lawn and garden okay. products. I've seen manufacturing processes. I've been in sales and marketing. So I had launched new products to the market. So as far as products goes, I was comfortable, but never shoes or. So yeah, to your point, I was like, okay, I have some really good ideas on on what would make a great shoe, but I'm not a shoe designer. So the, literally the first thing I did is I Googled free freelance footwear designers. The found them online. I, I interviewed and spoke with about five different designers and, and found one. His name is Brett Golf. He had worked at Nike, New Balance, 
really sharp guy and he 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 got it like right away he understood what i was trying to do and so him and i really hit it off and so from that point him and i spent about a year and a half doing research and design and development we worked together on it i interviewed lawn care workers landscapers i went to a lot of independent shoe stores i talked to the shoe store owners i said what are people looking for what's the comfort um just did a, a lot of time on research and design so that was the next step and then and brett was like okay um I'm going to create this document. It's called a tech pack. It'll be a 20 page document. You can hand it to a shoe factory and they can create your shoe. I'm like, whoa, this is amazing. So that was kind of the next step. And that's, so then we got to that point and then I was like, okay, now I have to figure out how to make this thing. And then that was the next thing I had to find a manufacturing partner. So, so. I, I didn't know these people even, I mean, I guess I knew shoe designers existed, but I always thought of them as like skaters or whatever that designed the new vans or something like that. And it's more about colors yeah. and, not functionality. So this guy actually went through, found, you told him what the needs were, you interviewed landscapers. What are you looking for? So what were some of the things that you found that they were looking for that you incorporated into your shoe? Yeah. Um, well, doing through a lot of the research, of course, and this is not surprising, comfort was the most important. So we, we always kept in mind comfort and that's where we designed uh, an EVA cushion midsole, which is similar to a lot of running shoes have. And so, so that was really important, but it, it was interesting doing my research. I thought maybe Maybe safety toe was going to be the number one important thing, but it wasn't. Now, there's a need, of course. We've since launched a safety toe boot. Landscapers need it. But that was really lower down than I thought, whereas like water resistance was super important. Breathability was a little more important than I thought. It makes sense. And a lot of people are doing it in the summer and the afternoons. Um, keeping keeping grass out of the shoe was pretty important. Um, really good grip was super important. So it was interesting to do that research and really, and then we and then it made our job kind of easier. We could fine tune the design and the materials specifically to those features. So you get that design, you have that, um, you're ready to go. Where do you go then next to find the, somebody to make the shoe? Yeah. Like yeah. how does so that even then, work? <laughs> so yeah, I keep bringing up Google, but I'm t it's crazy. Like literally you can start yeah. businesses just redoing This is how the world of works. <laughs> everything's online like i you know i spent yeah. hours and hours and hours and days and just researching manufacturing ideas and partners and con you know listen to start a shoe factory you need millions and millions of dollars i don't have that and and, and you know just my wife and i kind of bootstrapped this and and we, we we sunk our life savings into it and 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 you know we needed to find a contract manufacturing partner who makes who can make shoes with our design so the first thing i did is like making the usa of course would be amazing so i i did i researched months and months trying to i literally couldn't even get a quote from a, a u.s manufacturer unfortunately there's just not many shoe factors in the u.s anymore that are doing this so that was so i just kept searching i i did find um a brother and sister team based in minneapolis um and they helped startups like myself and so i went i flew out to minneapolis i met with them and they were phenomenal their 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 dad used to run nike factories back in the 70s and 80s and they they're shoe people they grew up in the shoe biz so they had a lot mm -hmm. of contacts. So that's that's how we got it off the ground. And they they agreed to take us on because the same similar to my designer, Brett, they said, well, this is a unique idea. You know, I kind of like this because they get a lot of people trying to come up with the next basketball shoe or running shoe. And that's really difficult to compete against Nike. Um, but to have something unique that that there's a need, um, they took me on. And so uh, they had they had factory partners all over the world and, and they were able to get mm -hmm. it produced for me. Yeah. So they can open doors for you. So that's good. So it's, yes. it is, it's about anything. It's about relationships. It's funny that it yes. starts with Google though. Um, <laughs> yeah. So you start with a good idea, which you have. Yeah. And, and now these partners who are in the business, they're, they're basically telling you, yes, we agree with you. This is a good yeah. idea. So you're making it through, you're finding good partners. Uh, what was your first run? Like how many shoes did you order? I'm sure you ordered prototypes first. Talk to me through that. Cause I, I want to get to the yeah. growth here. Right. And by the way, what year is this we're talking about when you're dealing with these folks out of Minneapolis, you're, what year is that? This is like 2017. Okay. So fairly recent, right? Okay. Yes. So where does it go from there? They're like, yeah, we're going to work with you. We like your idea. We think you got something here. We got some partners that can do this. What, what do you do next? Yes. So we get some prototype samples. So again, sinking some of our money into these prototype samples and, and we have working samples. So we get that. Um, the next thing I did is, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Kickstarter, but it's a, it's like a crowdfunding mm -hmm. platform. So in 2017, we said, let's do a Kickstarter. And, and the way that works for people who are not familiar, you have like 30 days and you set a goal. We set our goal. We need to raise $40,000 in 30 days. And you pretty much get people to pre-order your product. And if you right. if you sell pre-order at least, sell at least 
your goal, you get all that money, 40,000, and you can go to production. If you don't meet your goal, you get nothing. So that was a very stressful mm. 30 days. And, and we hit our goal. Right. So that helped us be able to go to raise some pre money. And then I did a round of investment with my family and friends. I'm hitting up my parents, my old high school buddies. I'm like, Hey, it's scratching and clawing any, any money I can get because making shoes is really expensive. I found, um, uh, not only the first production mm. run, but you have to invest in product tooling. So every single size of a shoe is thousands of dollars in product tooling. And we're doing a full size run. I mean, this is a lot of money just to invest in the tooling. And then mm -hmm. the minimum production run was 5,000 pairs. That's a lot of shoes. Wow. That's oh my a, gosh. So, yeah. Okay. So this, I mean, I, I put it all out there. Like I said, my wife and I, we, we, we put all of our life savings into this. We said, we truly believed it and, and hats off to her. You know, I, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for a supportive wife who said, I trust you. Um, yeah. Because that was, you know, we, we invested everything for 5,000 pairs of shoes it, it, and we didn't have any any proof for sure that it was going to work. You know, we felt like it would, but we we kind of went out on a limb with that. And that's how we had to go to production. And then we launched, we, we received those 5,000 pairs in spring of 2018. And that was when it was time to start selling them. That's and that's the thing I don't think about. Like I sell fertilizer, right? So I have five bags of fertilizer, two sizes. That's it. You have it's not only the multiple sizes. How many size? What size do you start at, and what size do you end at for you? We, we go down to a women's six and a half, uh, which is like men's five, up to men's fourteen. Right. So you have men's and women's, all sizes, and right, and then you also have colors, multiple right. colors right. in all sizes. So your inventory investment. You know, you when you're when you're in my business, you don't. I think I invest a lot in inventory. Holy cow, man! Like, <laughs> yeah, that is a bunch. Are you working a day job through all this? Or I mean, oh, at at this time when we were doing all this, absolutely. I was also I was the head of sales for a products company. Still, luckily, I was working from home. My company knew I was doing the shoe thing on the side, and they were cool with it. It was an entrepreneurial family that owned the, my day job business. They were cool. So I, yeah, for, for the first couple of years of Cujo, I was doing both. I had a full-time job and running this. So absolutely. Man. And so, yeah, so that, I understand that's gotta be stressful. So that first 5,000 pair come out. And so did you launch at GIE or did you launch earlier than that? How did you decide to take it to market from there? Yeah, we, we launched earlier. So GIE would have been that fall of October of 2018. So we launched in the spring and you know, this was another learning experience. You know, I was naive. You, I, I'm, I'm an optimist, of course. Most entrepreneurs are, and and naive. And I said, and I was thought to my head, you know what? We're gonna. Put, this is an amazing new product that's not out there. Once it hits the market, word's gonna spread like wildfire. People are just gonna. We're gonna sell out so quick. And you know, well, it it was a great product, but it, things don't just sell out. Like it takes a lot of effort in money marketing. So. Unfortunately, I just blew my whole budget on production. I literally had no marketing budget. Once and so mm -hmm. spring 18, we launched this new product with no marketing budget. So it's not like I can I'm not like a big brand that can spend, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on Facebook ads or Google ads to try to drive traffic to our site. We literally had to do it through word of mouth. I mean, we're we're, we're reaching out to everyone we could, to magazines, to newspapers, just trying to get people to hear about our brand. Uh, so that first year was a lot of work to try to get the word out. Yeah. So to give an idea now, we're uh, five years later. What type, if you don't mind sharing, you, your first run's 5,000. What type of runs are you doing now? Yeah. I mean, we're, now we're we're doing 10 to 15,000 runs, you know, at a time. And, and that's awesome. It's, we're, we're up there. And, and, and you had mentioned inventory. It's, it's a lot of learning now. So we we have really good analytics over the past few years of size and colors. And so if we're like, Hey, we're going to, we're going to do a run. You know, we kind of guessed on that the first year and we learned now we know, like if we're going to do a run of 10,000, I know to a percentage point, like what percentage is going to sell size, you know, 10 men's 10, 10 yeah. in, in each right. colorway. So we run everything by percentages and, 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 and you know, we got to plan it out six to nine months in advance, but we're pretty dialed in now. Yeah. So that's that optimization. It's just so funny how businesses you're optimized. You're only five years in and you're already optimizing um, yeah. to that point. That's just incredible. And so then do you have a warehouse or we do? Yeah. And it's never perfect. Right. So we're still going to sell out of certain colors and sizes once in a while, but sure. we're, we're, you know, it's, it's pretty dialed in. Um, yeah. So we have a, a main warehouse in Toledo, Ohio. So that's, that's our uh, core warehouse. And then, um, we, we sell through Amazon prime. So like we're in Amazon warehouses as prime there too. And then 
through our website. Uh, we run our website through Shopify and they have Shopify fulfillment networks that's all dialed in, really tied into the website nicely. So we're all over. So we have our core warehouse in Toledo. We have some Shopify warehouses for our site and we have some Amazon warehouses. Yeah. So, so you've had to not, now you've had to learn e-commerce. So a whole yes. nother learning curve, right? What are some challenges right. you faced? I faced the same one. You tell me, what are some of the things, uh, not frustrations, but challenges you've seen in e-commerce as a small business? Um, yeah, that, that was a whole nother learning. I knew the product part of it, but luckily one of my previous jobs was for a company called Fathead. I don't know if you've heard of that or, or your listeners. Oh yeah, but the it's wall like, things? Yeah, the wall yeah. things, like the life-size Tom Brady's and the, you know, the Detroit Tigers logo that you put on your wall. So I, and they're primarily an e-commerce business. So I worked there for three years and I learned a lot about e-commerce okay. there, which was very helpful to give me a little bit of a base at least. But you know, the challenges is just driving traffic um, and, and customer acquisition is, you know, that's, it's just, you know, once people are there, they love the product, but it's how do you get people to your website? And um, Google can get really expensive. One of the biggest challenges for us was um, last year or two years ago when Apple started doing uh, really hitting Facebook with privacy ads. So for those of you that don't know, like Facebook's great and not to be like creepy, but Facebook, you can really target interests and our shoes are very specific interests, right? It's a lawn mowing shoe. So when we launched, it was really helpful to just go to Facebook and say, we want to show our ads to people who like mowing their lawn. Um, and, and so that was great because we're getting the right audience. Um, and then just changes in algorithms between Apple and Facebook where we could reach those people pretty easily. It became a lot, lot tougher and a lot more expensive this past year. So that's where we had to say, OK, we need to do, you know, you're always evolving. Right. So we got to find new ways to get our brand out there. So it's it's always mm -hmm. things are always changing and, and you're always learning. Yeah. Are you doing your own Facebook ads? Are you placing them yourselves or do you work through a company? Yeah, no, uh, we do them. We do them ourselves. You do. So. Good. Well, that's good. You're learning. So we've seen the same thing, except what, what I've noticed is, so we have a good customer base of emails and so do you. So even though that targeting has gone away, you're right. It used to be super granular. Uh, now it's not, but because yes. you have your own database already, you can upload that and ask for lookalikes and, and keep, I don't know if you've tried that or not, but that'll actually yes. keep your audience really tight. That's why you'll see I'm not going to name them, but I see some of these new lawn care people uh, spray stuff in a bag, whatever. People trying to come in and sell DIY lawn care. And I look at their ads and I see their ads are all people like lawns are terrible. You're killing the environment with your lawn care because they can't target now. So what their target is like this general gardening and they're getting yeah. all the people, the gardeners that actually hate lawns. And I'm just like, yeah, there goes all that VC money getting spent. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. But when you have an audience that is targeted already and you can do lookalikes, you can actually then find those new people. So that's pretty cool. And that's where the relationships that you built too. I mean, obviously you've used, used influencer marketing. I've worked with you this year, yes. which was a great experience for me. And I want to talk about the pants in a minute, the trousers, but um, tell me some of the experiences there because influencer marketing is a new thing. It's something I want to start talking more about because obviously that's the, the niche that I'm in. And it's very interesting. There's no playbook for this. I can't go to college and say, this is a job that you want to do. Even though if you talk to every middle school kid these days, what do they want to be? They want to be an Instagrammer, or a YouTuber, or a TikToker, right. right? So how's that been? Um, you've worked with, um, well, a bunch of guys and girls. So tell me how that's yes. worked out for you and what, what you've learned there. It's been, it's been huge. It's been the best. And I mentioned 2018, I was naive. I thought this would spread. Well, the thing that really helped us and got it going is that, and I didn't even know this, like you had mentioned, you know, but I didn't even know this like YouTube, Instagram, lawn care, social media world existed at the time. And then one of our early customers e sent us an email and said, hey, you know, you should check out, and I think, you know, lawn care nut, and then you should check out these other guys on YouTube. They do a great job really educating people about lawns. And so, and this was a one of our early customers, he said, a guy like me who loves working on his yard, I watch these guys all the time and learn a ton. You should see if they mm -hmm. want to try your shoes. And so I was like, oh, so I, you know, reached out to you and, and a few other people, like you said, in the industry and, and didn't push. I just said, hey, you just want to try these. First of all, I want to get your feedback. You're, you're, you do this all the time. Are they good? And, and if they are good, do you mind, you know, test them for us and, and, and what, whatnot? And to your point, it, it, it really helps. So, Fortunately for us, a lot of the guys uh, loved our shoes and they started wearing them 2018, 2019 in their videos and on Instagram. And, and a few of the guys, they preferred their boots and that's fine. So, you know, we never want someone to wear our, that's the biggest thing. It's got to be true, right? So we never want an influencer to, to wear our stuff if they don't genuinely love it. So we're fortunate we got a good group of guys and girls that love our product. Um, and that's been huge. And, and 
that's really helped spread it because we, when in 2018, we had no audience on social media. We had nothing. We were trying to build it, but we were able to leverage people who had huge audiences and, and that trust already built with, and, and just kind of combine that and partner with them. It was huge. Yeah, I've noticed. So I've, I've known you since the beginning, pretty much, I guess. And we worked, uh, we did a couple of things at GIE. It was that in 2019, yeah. maybe. And uh, I now have noticed, because I watch for trends. The reason I go to the expo, it's not called GIE anymore. What are they called? Equip. Equ- Equip. The reason I go, I mean, I'm a DIYer. It's not for me. There's nothing there for me necessarily as a DIYer. Now I get a lot out of it. What I'm going for is, is I watch for trends. And I can tell you that this past year, I could see your shoes on a lot of people. A lot is not a technical term. But to the point, because they're distinctive, I can tell when somebody has Kuja shoes on. There's nothing else that looks like that because it's that cross between like the tennis shoe boot kind of look. And I yes. started seeing them. I'm like, wow, these are legit when these are these are ground pounded people here that are on and off mowers every day doing the work. And they're wearing them. I'm like, all right, that's really cool. So that's why I was like, oh, I'm interested to see kind of how you're going because it, it's it's not – it is in DIY. And I see them in my groups all the time. My DIYs like them. But we have a whole different thing. We're not going to wear them out as fast i would think we you know for us it's it's different than a guy that's literally pounding ground every single day so that's pretty cool that's been really cool to see i like the jags that you sent me those have become pretty much whenever my lawn is wet that's just what i go for because i don't like to lace things up so i mean i will endorse the jags all day long those are fairly new right how long have those been out yeah. yeah the less than a year so we we launched those last year and those are phenomenal those those things are, are selling out like crazy. So to your point, those, those have been a hit. You're not the only one that doesn't like lacing up their shoes. <laughs> yeah. Well, and those are, they're not completely waterproof, right? But what do you call it? Water resistant or. Yeah. We, we use the term water resistant just because we don't totally seal it up. You know, there's some stitching and we left a little breathability in the net, but we do put a waterproof, you know, we literally put a waterproof coating on our material and stuff. So it does a great job of keeping feet dry. We just don't like to claim hundred percent waterproof. So yeah, we say water resistant. Yeah. Yeah, because they remind me of good spray boots. Um, but I think most spray boots that people use are fully waterproof. But I, I don't know. I use them as spray boots as a DIY or two, and they work great. Um, so, yeah, awesome. Now, I want to talk about the pants because you guys are expanding, which this is what's cool. You're not just like, hey, I got a product that works. I'm just going to sit here and just do that. You're like, no, we're going to keep going. Let's keep going. So I worked with you on the trousers this year. I still wear them every day. I wear them to church because <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's just, great. you know. I don't really go to church anymore. I'm just kidding. No, I mean, I wear them like when I'm going out and I, and I wear them in the lawn. They can kind of go either way. It's hot here in Florida. They breathe. Um, so tell me about that. How did you get into the trouser business? Like the, again, a whole nother thing. We got sizes, we got colors. Now we have waist and length. So you're adding yes. more to your <laughs> algorithm here, right? So how, yes. how did you did, tell me how you went about that getting into that part of the business? Yeah. And, and you know, we, what's next, what's next. Like you said, we got, we got, and not that we got to be crazy. We have to be smart. We don't have unlimited funds here, but in my mind, I, you know, I want to launch one to two good functional products each year. You know, I don't want to do it just to do it. It's got to be a reason why we're launching a product. In the pants, we were getting a lot of requests for. Um, like you said, you know, sh- summertime shorts are great, but a, a lot of a lot of people either want to wear pants to pr- protect their legs and shins as they're trimming, or or their job requires it if they're a lawn care professional. Mm-hmm. A lot of those guys have to wear pants. So the goal with the pants was, okay, if we're going to do pants, let's make them literally like the most breathable, lightweight, comfortable, design them for summer specifically, warm weather. You're in Florida. So the, I'm glad you appreciate the, 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 mm-hmm. the, breathe, the, the breathing of them. But so we used the light ripstop material that was very light and stretchy and very durable. But, you know, I designed mesh through the whole back calf panel of the leg too to add even more breathability you know the first round of the pants didn't have that and they were pretty breathable i'm like how do we make them even more breathable how do we get some airflow going in there so that's when we did those those vented panels in the back of the calves um and and fortunately you know the feedback's been phenomenal not only by you but you know we've launched four products now yard shoes jags safety toe boots and pants and there's always things we improve on in the second production run. We get that feedback, but I will say our customer reviews of those pants have been the highest for an initial launch out of many of our products. Uh, people, mm-hmm. people love them. They work really well. Well, what's cool is you're starting to see now the second generation of being this small business is now you do have an audience that likes what you do and likes what you created. So now when you bring a new product, you don't have to go buy a new audience through Google pay-per-click. You can right. start it off with your current. I mean, that. so that's the exciting part to me is how you can, start launching new things. And again, it is, it's up to you to keep the brand solid. That's your job, right? Is to say, this is not something I'm going to put my name on. And this is, and you did really well. And I agree pants for, as a man, as a short man shaped like a bowling pin, pants are just hard for me 
to find in general that fit right. Everything I've said this, I said this when we worked together too, everything is so skinny cut now. Yeah. And, and I, I, I understand that people want that as a style, but that's not like comfortable, like comfortable as I need a, and not necessarily a boot cut, but I just need something that isn't pegged. I'm, a, I'm an yes. 80s kid. I like to peg my pants. Okay. That's fine. But that was in the <laughs> 80s. <laughs> right. I don't need pants that hug my calves, you know? So, right. um, I appreciate that too. And like I said, they are kind of, they're not dressy, but they could, they can be dressed up. So that's, yeah. they're versatile that way. So <clears throat> you have those in the, the camel tan, I call it a camel tan. It's a nice bright tan, which I think is cool for a work pant. And then the gray, yes. what's the, are you doing in more colors or what's, what, where are you going with that? No, not, not right now. We're just sticking with those two colors. The big thing is probably, you know, we need to expand sizing to your point. It's, it's tough with the waist and the length because there's so many, you know, options there. And and we kept it kind of limited just because we have to, we can't offer everything. Um, but you know, we, we need to expand the sizes. So that'll probably be next. But the other thing that we're actually in production now is we're launching shorts. So those will come out Mm -hmm. uh, this summer. So it's going to be the same material as the pants, very similar look as the pants, but just a short version. So we've had a lot of requests with that in the last year. So we're going to, we're excited to launch that this year too. Man, you should, you know, what you should release is some dad jean jorts. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Yeah. Come on, man. Let's bring back the dad jorts. Oh my gosh. (laughs) My wife would kill me if I tried to do that. (laughs) I think shorts are a great idea. Obviously, you know, a a big, and if you use that same fabric, I think you got a real... Yeah. So that's going to be solid. That'll be good. And yeah, I, th- I think about pants. So I, again, I thought, I think about challenges in business because you're growing, you're learning new things with pants. What I've always known, I used to get a lot of tailoring done when I was buying suits and stuff years ago is that, uh, pants have this, if you get a, say a 30 way 30, well, go to me, 34 waist, 30 length, the 30 length isn't always 30. There's like this, um, I don't know what they call it, but acceptable difference. So sometimes you get a 30, that's 30 and a half or even 31, sometimes 20. I'm, and and that's all pants. It's not just you. The ones I got from you were fine, but I'm just assuming that's just another challenge, right? It's another thing that maybe you got to, you got, all right, how do we deal with this? Like, (laughs) you know what I mean? It's like, gotta be tough. It's, it's, it is. And, you know, when it comes down to, you know, going back to you have, you know, this reminds me of you have your current customer base and it's really important to us as we grow and, and not having unlimited marketing funds to take care of customers. So to your point, like that's why we try to always do free, you know, we'll try, we do. We always do free shipping and then free exchanges on our shoes and our pants. So we're just like, hey, it, it, do us a favor, just try them inside the house, you know, that first day and that they're a little long, short, tall, small, whatever, you know, we cover the shipping to send those back, send you a new size because you know, it is tough. Pants and shoes can be tough to buy online without trying them on. So we try to make that as easy as possible for people too. Mm-hmm. And so how many customer service do you guys run that yourself too? We do. We do. Yeah. So we, we have, we have a couple, you know, we have two at our main warehouse with a lot of exchanges and shipping. And then we have one main customer experience manager named Brett. He was at Equip and he, he does a great job just managing all of that stuff. Are all these people, I'm going to get, I want to get more into the business now. Are all these people working from home or do you, they work at your office or? How does that work? Home. Yeah, we do 100% remote. So every everybody's everybody's working from home. Yep, including myself. So yeah, that's. I mean, my company's pretty much like that too. Except here at the warehouse, people have to be here. What? Right. Uh, how many employees do you have now? Uh, we we're still small. So technical employees, we have five, and then we have a lot of con- contract employees. So we have you know at our at our warehouse, we don't own our warehouse. There's you know, about 10 people that work on Cujo every day there. They're not technically Cujo employees, but they're working on our business mm-hmm. every day. Um, same sure. thing with our, our manufacturing team. Um, we have about six people on our manufacturing team that work on Cujo every day. They're not technically Cujo employees, but that's another six working there. Um, and then we have a team that helps with our Amazon. There's four people there. Again, not technically Cujo employees, but we contract them out. And so, you know, when you talk about our contract partners that that help us, you know, we're, we're closer to over over 20 working on the business uh, for Cujo. That's awesome. That's that's a lot of growth in in literally just five, six years. So yeah. congratulations. I mean, I love hearing that story. And again, it's a it's something you're serving the green industry. You're making good products for us. And so I think that's awesome. Tell me what's what's next? Like where where you, what you told me a little bit about the shorts, but what, I mean, what's yeah. the big picture here? Where do you have a big goal or a, you know, where you want to be in 10 years? What's, what are you looking for there? 
Yeah, I mean, the, the the big goal is just to be more of a household name when it comes to outdoor workwear, just in general, right? So, you know, we want to have very functional uh, and good quality footwear and apparel. Um, for in, And again, primarily outdoor work is, is going to be what we want to focus on. So we have a, a long ways to go to get there. You know, we're, we're growing, but we're still a relatively small brand. Um, so, so we have a lot of work there. And then as far as products, we want to keep launching good quality products. You know, luckily our customers give us a lot of feedback all the time. We love it. Mm -hmm. Not only to ways to improve our product, but new product ideas. So, you know, the next thing we're launching this fall actually is, is a four season booth. So you're in Florida and you don't necessarily get the four seasons, but a lot of the country does. And most of our stuff has all been geared towards spring, summer, spring, summer. Um, so this next boot is hundred percent waterproof, completely sealed up. And it's going to work well through the winter months, the fall, the sl early slushy spring. Um, so it's it's not going to be a safety toe boot. It's going to be soft toe, so really light and comfortable, but totally sealed up. So that that's what we're launching this fall and all four season. And I think what makes sense to go with that is to also do a cold weather pant. So, you know, our current pant mm. is very great for hot weather. But as we launch this four season boot for the winter, we want to do some cold weather pants to go with that. Um, and then you had mentioned, you know, spraying and chemicals. So. Uh, more of a rubber, you know, if people are some uh, uh, familiar with like the extra tough boot, that's like a rubber, you know, a rubber yeah. boot. So we're actually, I'm kicking around designs right now on a potential like Cujo version of more of an extra tough rubber slip on boot too. Oh, I'd definitely be a, a player there. So I have a pair of those and I can tell you, cause I wear them fishing. Not that I go fishing much, but I want to look like a fisherman when I do. And so right. every fishing guide here wears extra tough. So that's where yeah. I, and that's the next thing. Have you found crossover industry? Like if you do an, an extra tough kind of, kind of boot, I can tell you that here in Florida anyway, fishing guides is could be another vertical for you. Yeah. Have you found any other industries that are like, well, I know that's called Cujo Yardware, but we like it for this. A little bit. I, I try to be careful. It's so tempting because there's so many ways where, you know, as far as our marketing, we really are still focusing 100% on this niche, you know, yard Going care, yeah. lawn care. So purposely we're, we're, we're focusing, but one, I'm trying, yeah, there, there are always some that come up. One that came up uh, last year was mail carriers and, and delivery guys. Oh, so there you go. Yes. This, this, uh, the U.S. postal worker reached out for the our all black yard shoes and he's like, these will be perfect because last time we're walking through wet grass and just putting a lot of steps and delivering mail and packages in, in, just like the yard, he, I realized there's this whole mail mail carrier Facebook group and all this stuff, and word started mm -hmm. spreading within that group, and, and we got some traction there. there. So, yeah, there, there's I think there's a lot of applications where our shoes would work great. Anyone who's like working outside, going through some wet grass and stuff, it's a it'll it'll work. Yeah, so that's what's cool about it is you get you get into that niche you didn't try to get into, and you're like, oh, we're big in the postal community. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I love stuff like that as you learn as you go. So. Uh, the last thing I want to ask, and I've heard the story before, but I think our customers would like to hear, what is the origin story of the name Cujo? I know, and I know it's a personal thing to you. Tell us about why, why the name Cujo. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So Cujo is actually named after my cousin. So um, growing up, uh, my, my, my best friend and my cousin, Dave, Dave uh, Kuyava is actually his last name, K-U-J-A-W-A. -A. His nickname was Cujo. So everyone called him Cujo, Cujo. And like I said, he was two years older than me. I really looked up to him and him and I were always outside. He hated video games. He's always like, let's go outside. Let's go outside. Um, and then as he got older in his 20s, he moved to downtown Detroit. He he built out like community gardens. He loved gardening and being outside. He did a lot with the community and just a just a really cool guy. Unfortunately, he passed away when he was around 30. Um and so that was a few years before we launched launched this business. And so named it Cujo in, in honor of my cousin. Yeah, I think that's awesome. It's just uh, so great. I love it, man. I love your business and where you're going. And I'm really glad we're working together now. And yeah, Amy, why don't you tell everybody where they can find you and uh, yeah, where you at online? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, we're on Instagram and Facebook. It's just at Cujo Yardware, K-U-J-O Yardware. And then, you know, our website is just Cujo.com. Very simple, K-U-J-O.com. So, you can see all of our different products there and, and we have tons, we have thousands of reviews. So anyone who's curious, feel free to read through our reviews and, and see what other people are saying about, about our product, but that's where you can check us out. Awesome. All right. Anything else you want to throw out there, Sean? I, I've been talking a lot, asking you questions, but anything else you want to throw out there? <laughs> no, I think we're good. I just, I just appreciate you having me on here. This is fun. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing you. I mean, I guess you're going to launch those shorts here soon. So we'll see what happens there at, G at the expo this year. 
And I yes. uh, just look forward to seeing you guys grow and, and move forward and what else you do. Oh, I know what All I was right. going to ask you. Gosh, I can't believe I forgot this. Hold on. I, I have a friend that will kill me if I don't ask you this. When are you coming out with sun shirts? I'm sure you get that request all the time. You know what I'm talking about? The one, the, yes. the they're like Hook or, or Costa has them. Sun shirts. Yes. So have you yes. been asked about yes, that a lot? That are like the SPF 50, very light, long yeah. sleeve sun shirts. Yeah. I don't know. I think probably next summer. We, you, To your point, we've gotten a lot of requests for those. So yeah. nothing in the works. So we won't have them this season. But I, I think that that's a smart uh, next thing for next year. Yeah, the t-shirt business is a whole nother thing, man. <laughs> I've actually looked into that just because we do merch and I just don't like the way merch works for somebody like me. So I'm like, oh, I'll just do this myself. And I spent about 10 minutes figuring that out. I'm like, no, I will not be doing this myself. <laughs> so, right. and, yeah, I'm sorry. And, I, have a... I was going to yeah. say, that's where we're at too. We do some Cujo branded t-shirts here and then, you know, that's more just like yeah, merch just stuff for our brand. But to your point, to do an actual functional sun shirt is a whole nother thing that I think would be great. Yeah. All right. I had, like I said, I got a friend that he made me make sure I asked that. So that's awesome, Sean. Thank you again for the time today. And I look forward to, to working with you in the future and seeing you uh, at the expo again this year. All right. Appreciate it, Alan. Awesome. All right, y'all. There you go. Hopefully this podcast has been helpful to you. Hopefully you've learned a little something or it's helped you to pass the day. Wherever you are, I hope the sun is shining on you. And I hope that at some point in the next very near future here, you get to enjoy the moment. With that, I'm Alan Hamel, Lawn Care Nut. Thanks for so much for watching and I'll see you in the lawn.